I thought about it as we were on our way uh, from Anchorage yesterday. I said, well, for one thing, if, if nothing else, uh, when we finally got to see Brother and Sister Mendenhall at the airport, it was just sweeter because we weren't sure we were going to get to see them. <laughs> and so it is a joy to be here. And I, I feel like I'm just with family. I want to say, you may be seated because I'm just going to take my time if that's all right with you. Uh, because I feel some things here I want to say. And number one, I want to say, wow. There has been such a maturity that has taken place since I was here last year. And uh, I know tonight is just us. And uh, so I just felt like this is, and it's probably supposed to be. Um, but I I've, I've felt like to tell you that I saw where this church is in the spirit. And, uh, and then when I got here, it just confirmed it. But you know, before the battle takes place, the, the, the leaders of the, of the army, of the military, get around a table. And that table is set out according to the battlefield where they're going to be fighting. And they begin to tell what part of what group is supposed to go where and when. And they strategize the battlefield. And I feel some things to say in the Holy Ghost. Number one is that I feel that's where you are right now. You're not fighting a battle, but you're getting ready and you're strategizing. I can see, I can see the leaders of this church standing around a table and you're looking at it and you're determining what is the course of action that God wants you to take. And I want you to understand, uh, first of all, don't be discouraged um, that maybe you look around and it doesn't seem like you have grown when there has been so much prophetic utterance that has been spoken about you growing in this church becoming, uh, having more people. What has happened is this church has done something that is more important than outward growth. This church has grown inwardly. And I'm telling you, walking into this place, when I walked up the stairs, I could feel the power of the Holy Ghost. When I saw how you were worshiping and praising God and the level of maturity in your prayer life, I said, Dear God, this church has taken a leap in the Spirit and has grown in a very special and powerful way. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not here to flatter you because I don't gain anything by that. And I have to be honest. And honestly, I can tell you that I see that, you know, I thought it was good when I came here last time. But my goodness, you have grown in the spirit. You've grown in your fervor, your desire, your focus, your vision. And all of that was necessary for what God is about to do. You see, why would God bring a, a large group of people into a place where people are disconnected and people are not spiritually mature or focused? But there is a focus like a laser light in here. And, and I can see that you ha are just now getting ready for the harvest that God is going to send. But if I've ever felt like a church was ready, I feel like you are moving into that position and that God is about to open up the windows of heaven. Yes. And I, I, I'm, you know, I'm just going to bear my heart here because I feel it in the Holy Ghost. And, uh, and I'll just tell you that, you know, you've sowed the seed, but you don't sow seed in the barn. You sow seed in the field. And so this church needs to become field conscious that when you're out there, you are looking for people that are hungry. You are looking. Let the Jesus in you reach out to them. And, and, and that's what's going to draw them, not to this church, but to this people. This building is not the church. And so many times, and you know that, you know that. But whenever we start talking about bringing people to church, we talk about bringing them to this building. So we're talking out of both sides of our mouth. This people, it, it, you're the church, and the church is going to go out of the building, and it's going to reach people and bring them to the church, all right? They'll eventually get to the building, but they need to get to the church first. Amen? Hallelujah. And so I'm, I'm already preaching, but I'm, I'm telling you, something is stirred in me because of what I see, and it's a good thing. And, and I'm just so happy and, and just proud that we can be a part and be connected to this church. And I just want you to know, uh, you, you know, your, your pastor asked me to be the bishop of this church, and I count that a high honor. But I will tell you something. I, I'm very, very proud with a spiritual pride to be connected to this church at all, because I believe you're about to do something great in God. And I'm not, I don't have any reason to flatter you. I feel that. How many feel that? Yes. You feel the potential? Yes. Amen. Yes. There's a great potential here. Yes. Amen. 
Now let me just stop a minute and say that they don't come any better than Brother and Sister Mendenhall. And I love them dearly. He's like a brother, I, you know, a, a brother from another mother, I guess. But uh, it's just, I, I was thinking about it today. Dear God, you are so good to me to even let me meet some, some a special couple like that. And then it lead me to, to meet this church. And, and uh, just God is so good. Can amen. you say amen? amen. The only way he could get better is if we just got a King, King Salmon while we're here. And, yeah. you know, that would be the only way it could get better than it already is. Amen. amen. Hallelujah. Um, in prayer, and, and you know, I, we've talked about the delay. Um, but uh, we went back home and I thought, boy, I, I didn't dream I'd be sleeping in my bed tonight. But uh, as I was laying there in the bed uh, and then when I first woke up in the morning, I wake up in the morning, God starts speaking to me and, and the Lord started talking to me. He said, this is what I want you to do in Sadatna. And I said, okay. And it just began to flow. And I said, God, you've got a purpose for this meeting. It's not just us getting together and having a good time and enjoying even just random sermons. But uh, I'm going to do something probably different. And I don't know if, if it's something you're used to. Maybe it is. But I'm just going to teach until we run out of time. And then I might just pick up where we left off the next night and teach till I run out of time. Is that all right? Amen. My desire is to put meat on your bones. I'm really not here to inspire you. I don't think you need to be inspired. It looks like to me you already are. Your worship shows me you're inspired. Your prayer life shows me you're inspired. You know, it's funny that in the old Webster Dictionary, if you look at inspiration, it literally meant breathed on by the Holy Ghost. That's what the word inspiration meant. That's what Webster wrote as the definition for inspiration. Well, if I've ever seen a church that's being breathed on by the Holy Ghost, now the Holy Ghost wants to breathe through you. That's the next level. Can you say amen? And so I, I feel in the Holy Ghost to teach this. And, um, and when the Lord gave it to me, it's been several years since I've even visited the subject, but... You would know God is never finished, and so he gave me more, and it just began to pour out. And my wife said, I'm going to run to the church and pray. And I said, well, I'm going to sit here because God's talking, and i got to type. <laughs> so so uh, she left and left me at the house with Jesus, and, and he just began to give me what I hope to share with you tonight. We're going to Proverbs, the ninth chapter, verse number 1. And um, I can't say thank you enough for the hospitality and the kindness and, uh, and all that, that uh, y'all mean to me and all that you've done for me. And it's good to see all of you. So good to see all of you. Amen. Proverbs, the ninth chapter and verse number one. <clears throat> kind of different to start a revival like this, but this is what God wants. Yes. Wisdom hath builded her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. Everybody say seven pillars. Seven pillars. She hath killed her beast, which are beasts to be eaten. She hath mingled her wine. She hath also furnished her table. She hath sent forth her maidens. She crieth upon the high places of the city. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, she saith unto him, Come eat of my bread and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Forsake the foolish and live and go in the way of understanding. Everybody say the way of understanding. The way of understanding. Then verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. For by me thy days shall be multiplied, and the years of thy life shall be increased. Amen? Amen. And so I want to talk to you about the seven pillars of wisdom. And I really would have thought that this would be more of a Sunday school class, but I feel like God is equipping. And so tonight is just the beginning. And I'll just tell you right now, I'm setting the foundation for even more that I feel like God's given me. And I've ever felt a purpose for a meeting and a focused direction. It is for this meeting. And so I feel like that God brought you to me and God brought me to you. And it obviously was God and not American Airlines. Right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And so I believe there's a purpose in this meeting and that it is going to be fulfilled. So we're going to pray right now that nothing will hinder it and that God will let the transaction of the Spirit take place in this service. Can we pray, Lord Jesus? My King, my Savior, my Father, I glorify you, magnify you. I pray that you'll just let me be your mouthpiece to say what you have me to say. Lord God, feed your sheep. 
feed them what they need, God. And I pray that you will equip this church and impart unto this church, Lord God, not ever, everything, God, that they need, not one thing lacking, but everything they need to fulfill your purpose. And anoint me and help me, God, just to be your mouthpiece to say what you'd have me to say. And I give you the praise and the glory and the honor and the thanksgiving for it in the matchless eternal name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you. Would you praise him with me right now? Would you praise him with me? Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus. And everybody say in Jesus name. And you may be seated. When we talk about wisdom, many times, you know, you'll say that person has wisdom. And what you're talking about is that that person seems to understand things about life. I've gotten wisdom from my grandfather. I've gotten wisdom from uh, pastors and friends of mine uh, just giving me advice about certain things. And there's nothing wrong with that. But that is not the wisdom that this verse is talking about. In fact, I'll just be honest with you. When I taught this to my church several years ago... I didn't even realize what I was talking about. <laughs> and God began to, when God brought it back, I mean, now the clear blue, you don't teach something for 10 years and all of a sudden you wake up and the Lord says that message. And I went, whoa, I got to go find that, <laughs> you know, and I'm literally, I had to go find it. And I'm going, heavens, it's been so long. But then when I began to look at it that morning, the Lord said, now, let me tell you what you were talking about because you didn't know. <laughs> And he began to show me what true wisdom is. And I'm going to be talking about uh, in the next couple of services about how to understand your inner man and how to surrender the inner man to the Holy Ghost that dwells within you so that you can walk as Christ. And all of us need to know how to do that. That's not just for the preachers. That is for all of us. And if there ever was a time when all of us need to know that, it is today. Can you say amen? Amen. But you see, the thing about it is, and, and this is the way the Lord said it to me, so I don't know any better, but just to say it the way he said it. He said, it is a shame and a disgrace and an insult to appear before a king with tarnished armor. So there comes a time when the armor has to come off. And it's amazing that your, your, your uh, pastor said that just a few moments ago. And I go, whoa, this is going to be a great week. I can tell it right now. But he said, you need to take off your armor and you need to get ready. Well, you know what? The only way you can polish armor is to take it off. There's a time when it's not time to fight. There's a time when you are to appear before the king and you are to make sure that your armor is polished and ready. Now, you know, some churches, all they do is polish their armor. <laughs> okay? And unfortunately, that's not good either. <laughs> I mean, the armor has a purpose, and the purpose is battle. Yes. But some places I've been, I mean, they're fighting everything that moves, whether God wants them to or not. Right. There's got to be a balance. a balance. You never unsheath your sword unless you have permission. Yes. And you never fight alone. Yes. Can you say amen? amen? And so I know that there's spiritual warfare that's been going on here, but we have to be very careful that we do not engage an enemy that is supposed to be there. Oh, okay, you want scripture. Very good. In Judges, the third chapter, the Lord said, I want you to leave these five tribes of Israel so the next generation will know how to make war. So, all of the Canaanites were conquered or ran out of the land except for five tribes that God chose to keep in place for a purpose in the future. And that's so Israel would have somebody to fight. Okay? I'm just diving right into this, but I know I have the liberty to do that. You know, whenever you begin to do spiritual warfare, you have to ask God for permission. Never fight anything that, you know, well, it's there. That's not the reason to fight it. Okay? I know sometimes we get so bold and so anointed, we feel like we could just, you know, go, we could go against hell with a water gun. But I'm telling you, that's not wisdom. We're talking about wisdom, okay? And wisdom is you never engage an enemy that God does not give you authority to engage. Because you see, 
God is good. I was sitting in the airport and I said, Lord, you've been so good to me. And I'm, I'm telling you, me and Jesus had a conversation right there in the airport. And he said, no, I'm just good. And I said, yeah, I know you're, you're good. You've been so good. He said, no, you know, if you have any dealings with me, it will be good. I'm good. That's all I am. I don't know how to be anything but good. And he said, when I created the world, I made sure that everything I did measured up to what I expected because I only expected good. So he created things and he said it was good. All right. In other words, it was what he wanted. It was according to his will. So he said, I'm good. That's all I am. I'm just good. He said, whenever I need something done that is not good, Whenever I need evil done, like when he uh, wanted to destroy Ahab because Ahab had become an enemy to his purpose, he said, that's when I use the demonic realm. They're my servants. So you see, there are spirits that are in this city that are serving his purpose. And if you come against them, you're an enemy to the throne of God. And there's been people that have tackled spirits just because they were there. And I'm telling you that if you go against an enemy that you don't have permission to come against, you're in a very dangerous place. And there's been people that have been struck with disease and all kind of things and their families have fallen apart and, and there's just been wreaking havoc in the church because they were fighting everything that was moving and it wasn't God's will. So I feel in the Holy Ghost to tell you that you never engage an enemy unless the Lord says, pray against that. Amen. And you never do it by yourself. So that's what we've come to do in this meeting, and I feel in the Holy Ghost. I'm just going to try to share some more with you because I feel like you've come to a place of maturity that you can receive it, and, uh, and, and, and hopefully the Lord will do whatever He wants to do here tonight. We want to talk about the wisdom of the Holy Ghost, the wisdom of God. Now, look at some things about wisdom here in Proverbs, the ninth chapter. First of all, it said that wisdom built her house. Now understand that the reason that, that wisdom is personified as a, a woman here is because women are... No, 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 that's not really true. Y'all wanted me to say that, women. You want me to say women are smarter than men. No, that's not the reason. Now that might be true. It's true as far as me and my wife, for sure. But it's not necessarily, you know, well, I'm going to get out of that before I get in trouble, okay? Right off the bat. The Bible personifies wisdom as a woman because wisdom will nurture you and wisdom is productive. Wisdom will reproduce the things that God wants in your life. And of course, a woman's uh, body was created to reproduce. And so that's why the Bible in his wisdom used the woman as a personification of wisdom. And the Bible says that wisdom built her house. And when she built her house, she hewn out seven pillars. Now, in the, in the yeshiva, in the Jewish schools, from the time that they're very young to the time they're about six years old, to the time that they're uh, around 18 or 19 years old, they go to yeshiva, and yeshiva is Bible school in the Jewish culture. And so uh, when they're there, they memorize a lot of things. They memorize the law, and then they memorize some extracurricular things. And one of them is the seven pillars of wisdom. Now, they were so common that when, when he's writing the book of Proverbs here, and we believe that it was Solomon that wrote the ninth chapter, and he's writing the book of Proverbs, he is saying this. He's saying, wisdom built her house, and she hew out seven pillars. Now, there's no reason for me to mention what the seven pillars are, because you already know, because you've learned it in yeshiva all your life, so we're not even going to go there, all right? What we find is that later on, James begins to talk, Talk about the, the pillars of wisdom and we're going to talk about them and he names them because it's been so far removed uh, into the New Testament that he feels like they need to be mentioned again. It's kind of ironic that in this it doesn't tell you what the seven pillars are. It just says that she hewed out seven pillars. He is referring to the traditional teaching of the seven pillars of wisdom and we're going to talk about what those are. And then she prepared a feast. Wisdom prepared a feast. When you begin to walk in the wisdom of the Holy Ghost, it is going to make you productive to the kingdom. 
When you begin to walk in the wisdom of the Holy Ghost, God is going to begin to nurture things in you, and you are going to begin to nurture things that are in the kingdom. Can everybody say amen? Amen. When you begin to walk in the wisdom of the Holy Ghost, it is going to be a feast. Okay? There is going to, God, the, the, the wisdom will feed you. And wisdom will strengthen you. And wisdom will fortify you. And that is what she's talking about. She prepares a feast. Why? Because this woman knows that a feast will attract the crowd. And so she prepares a feast. She kills the beast. And she cooks the beast and gets them ready. She mingles her wine. Now it's very important when you read this. Because this is not saying that it's okay for us to drink wine. What it is saying here is that she took the wine and she watered it down. Because the purpose was not to make people drunk. Wisdom will not make you drunk. Okay? Wisdom will calm your thirst. All right. She takes the wine, she mixes it with water. It's not so the wine will go farther. It's because her purpose for the wine is not a party and it's not to make people drunk. They would take wine and water it down uh, because the water that they had in that day was you couldn't drink it. So the wine was an antiseptic that purified the water. In other words, all the wine was was an antiseptic to purify the water. So the water, it would kill all the micro in the water and make it safe to drink. So she's not advocating that you get drunk on wine. She's mingling. I'm telling you, there's some great stuff in here. But she's mingling the wine with water because her purpose is different. When you begin to walk in the wisdom of the Holy Ghost, and that's what this week's going to be about. When you learn to walk in the wisdom of the Holy Ghost, there's going to be something that's going to be very powerful. One thing is that you are going, your thirst is going to be quenched. You're going to begin to begin to become satisfied walking with God. And you're not going to desire the things of this world as much as you used to because your focus is going to be on spiritual things in the kingdom. Can you say amen? Amen. But also, wisdom is an antiseptic that will protect you from the things that are in your environment that can poison you or affect you. It meets your needs, it meets your thirst, but it also purifies you. And so she prepared a feast. And she said, here's the beast, I've killed the beast and I've prepared them. And here's the the wine that I've taken the time to mingle with water so that it would be safe to drink, so that it would meet your need as far as your thirst. In other words, I'm going to feel your hunger and I'm going to feel your thirst. And then she sent her maidens out. And her maidens went forth to the high places of the city and invited anybody that wanted to come. But here's the purpose. Whenever they began to go forth, this is what they said. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, she saith unto him. So what what those, those maidens were saying is before you can really benefit from wisdom, you've got to realize that you don't already have it. You see... To walk in the wisdom of the Holy Ghost, there has to be a crucifixion of your own ideas. Am I helping anybody? You see, if I, if I filter everything God tells me through what I think should be happening, <clears throat> I hinder and alter what God wants to say. There's been times when God said, say this, and I'm like, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Lord, that don't make any sense. Not in this situation. That's the last thing I need to say right now in this situation. But I've learned that when I go ahead and say it, it becomes the perfect thing to say. That whenever I speak, whatever I speak, you know, I'll tell you, those that know me know this. I mean, uh, my message, like you said, is not on this iPad. All I've got is scripture on this iPad. The message is coming from the voice of God that I hear and repeat what he says. So I preach by revelation. You know what that means? I don't know what's coming either. (laughs) 
But you see, what I'm doing is I'm allowing his wisdom to flow through me and I'm becoming neutral. It's just a voice and I'm not tainting it and I'm not changing it and I'm not altering it and I'm not fitting it into my uh, idea or my thinking and I'm not conditioning it to whether it's suitable for that environment or not. I'm just saying what he tells me to say. Wisdom is surrendering to his wisdom. And the only way that you can walk in his wisdom is for you to become simple. Now, that word simple there means unlearned. It means you don't know what you're doing. It means you're unskilled. It means you don't have the ability. You see, if you think you have the ability, God can't use you. The people that think they really can preach, just preach sermons. But the people that say, God, you better help me because if you don't, I am going to bore some people and I'm going to embarrass myself. That's the one God uses. Come on, somebody. I can't tell you how many times at a conference that I was one of the conference speakers. I'm sitting on the front row and everybody's looking at me like I've got it together. And I'm saying, dear God, you better do something. Oh, Lord, have mercy. It's going to be a mess. (laughs) And I get up there and I read the text and it goes. I'm like, okay, we can do this. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Amen? But the secret is through Christ, not through ourselves. So we have to decrease so that he will increase. We have to minimize so he can maximize. We have to disappear so that he can appear. Everybody understand? The principle to, to be elevated in the kingdom, you have to abase yourself. And so what, notice this, that it'd be kind of funny for you to tell somebody, hey, look, wisdom has, is throwing a feast, but the only people that are welcome are simple people. <laughs> okay, only the people that are unlearned, unskilled, and, and they don't have any ability at all are willing, are able and, and invited to come to this feast. But you see, that's the problem, is, is that it's very hard for us to put ourselves in neutral and put him in drive. But you cannot be in drive and him in drive at the same time. Right. All you're going to have is confusion. Right. And so what the world tells you, and even, even what some, and I, I don't have anything against Bible schools. I mean, I, I believe in Christian education. I founded several Bible schools in, in Mississippi, Purpose Institutes, and I believe in it. But I'm going to tell you that some Bible schools will tell you that you've got to learn how to preach. But I'm here to tell you that if you're a preacher, that what you need to do is learn Jesus, learn submission, learn surrender, learn the word so he can recall it when he wants it. That that going out and learning the skill of being an orator. We do not need any more orators in the church. We need oracles. I mean, I've seen these guys get up and pull out their best message and preach. and, And man, they'll rock the house and then nothing happens. Nothing spiritual takes place. Everybody gets a blessing. Everybody shouts and dances and they go home. But you know what? When the word of God goes forth, when wisdom goes forth, lives are changed, paradigm shifts take place. All of a sudden you look in the mirror and you're not looking at the same person and you're not focused on the same things. Why? Because impartation takes place when the word of God and the word of wisdom takes place. And so as God begins to speak to you, those things that he says are going to take place if you'll surrender to them. When a man of God is preaching out of the word of wisdom, he is sowing seed in your soul. He is sowing seed in your inner man. He is showing you what the will of God is. And if you will surrender to it, it will manifest itself in you. Can somebody say amen? Amen. So whoever is simple, let him come. And for them that wanteth understanding. Now the word wanteth there is not desire. The word wanteth there means you know you need it. Yes. (laughs) Okay, when you say, okay, uh, uh, I am wanting, which means I don't have any money, okay? (laughs) Whenever you realize, wait a minute, it's not that I just want this, Mm -hmm. but it's that I realize that I need it. I am wanting, I am am needing this. And so I I can't, this is not an option. I can't operate. I'm going to tell you, if the Holy Ghost does not give me utterance, I cannot operate. I told God, don't ever let me go anywhere that you're not. Because I'll be in a mess because I can't operate unless you're talking. Yes. And I'm just being honest with you. Can I just be honest with you? Yes. Yes. 
Everywhere I go, that's the way it is. And, and that's the way it's got to be. That is the apostolic way of ministry. There, it was never meant just to share a sermon. It was meant to impart spiritual power and authority in the word that is spoken, not by the man, but by the lips that are speaking what God says. And there's got to be a restoration of the Spirit speaking to the church. And the only way that can happen is not through a nifty sermon, but through the anointing of the power of the Holy Ghost that is speaking through the man of God by the wisdom of God. So to tell you what wisdom is, wisdom is when you surrender your inner man to what the Holy Ghost is saying. And that is what God wants us to do, is to walk in the wisdom. And this is, what, this is what she says. Come, eat of my bread. Drink of the wine which I have mingled. Isn't it funny that the scripture repeats that it's mingled? Isn't that funny? Because the purpose is not to get drunk. The purpose is not revelry. The purpose is not to party hardy. The purpose is to purify you. When you drink this mingled wine, it's going to put antiseptics in you that are going to purify you. And so you see, it says again, the wine which I have mingled, forsake the foolish and live and go in the way of understanding. So the, the, the declaration of what wisdom is saying is forsake the foolish and live and go the way of understanding. In other words, let your pursuit be the pursuit of God and understanding Him. It's not talking about physical understanding. It's talking about spiritual understanding. So you need to pursue it and go in the way of understanding. And if that doesn't make it clear enough, look at verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, when I was here last year, I talked about the fear of the Lord. Yes. The fear of the Lord is, is not just reverencing God. The word fear there actually means reverence. So uh, the fear of the Lord is not just reverencing God uh, as in putting him in a place of reverence, but referencing God. Okay? Yes. Reverencing God is when you, you treat him like he's your God. You worship Him, you're faithful to Him, you're obedient to Him, you're compliant to His will, and you're surrendered to His purpose. But you see, the, the only problem with that is a lot of people do that, but in referencing God, it means that you bring yourself to the level of servant and let Him be the Lord, and now He is in control of every decision because you don't even own yourself. That's right. Thank you, Jesus. Think about it. Yes. You don't own anything. Nope. No. Nope. There's not a person in here that's a child of God that owns anything. Right. How can you own anything when you don't even own you? That's right. Amen. Right. You don't own you. If you're filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name, you belong to Jesus. Yes. You know what? I was teaching this at Brother Betcher's church in Illinois, and we did three nights, body, soul, and spirit. We were talking about healing and, and being whole. And I told them, I said, listen, you need to start living in the understanding that, you, that your body doesn't even belong to you. You know, I, I said that I was preaching that at Brother Betcher's and the Holy Ghost spoke to me. And there's some things he say I don't repeat. He said, well, if, my, if that body belongs to me, then you need to quit making it fat. <laughs> you, need to, you need to start watching what you eat, you know. And I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, it belongs to you. So, you know what the Lord said to me? He challenged me. He said, listen, why don't you let me start ordering for you when you're in a restaurant? Why don't you ask me what you can have? That's a novel idea, isn't it? But if I belong to him, does he have that right? He have that right. Amen. So when people argue, you know, well, I know I've got the Holy Ghost baptized in Jesus' name, but uh, I'm going to wear this even though it's not appropriate. Really? How can you say Jesus is Lord when he's not Lord of your wardrobe? I'm meddling. I know I am, but I'm bishop. I can. <laughs> you don't belong to you. You don't belong to you. What's the argument about? 
if, if he bought you with the blood of Jesus Christ, yes. you are a purchased possession. Yes. And if that's the case, everything you own belongs to him. Oh, yeah. Get up every day and thank him that he lets you borrow his yes. stuff. Yes. Thank you, Lord, that you let me live in your house. Thank you, Lord, that you let me drive your car. Thank you, Lord, that you let me wear your clothes. Yes. Well, you know, I give him my 10%, but 90 is mine. That's not, the, that's not the case. 10% is how obedient you are. 10% makes him Lord of your finances. But honestly, if you're walking in the spirit of the Holy Ghost, everything belongs to him. Yes. I remember one time, I, my wife and I, we, 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 uh, our air conditioner stopped working in our old house. And, and um, so that we called the guy and the guy came and he said, look, you got holes in the egg hole and, and it's going to cost this much money for you to be able to put, uh, put it in a new egg hole in. And, and I looked at her and she looked at me and we knew one thing, we didn't have that money. And I had just preached to the church because God had just given me understanding about the fact that nothing belongs to me. And I told him, go home. I said, here's the way that you can make sure that God never takes a thing away from you. Just go home, get on your knees and give it all to him. And that way, if he takes it, it was his to begin with. You don't have to ever worry about losing another thing. Because you don't have anything to lose. Come on, somebody. (laughs) So, anyway, I looked at her and I said, what are we going to do? And she said, I don't know, but we don't have that money. I said, come over here. I got the oil out. You remember that? I opened up that door and I said, put your hand on that air conditioner. That air conditioner belongs to God. And I said, God, fix your air conditioner because I don't have the money to. (laughs) And I promise you, that's the way I prayed. And she was looking at me like I was crazy. Within two hours, that thing started cooling. Thank you, Jesus. Four years later, lightning struck the outside unit. The guy came to fix it. And when he came in there, he said... I don't know how in the world that this air conditioner has worked at all. He said, the a hole is full of holes. And he said, this thing was cooling? I said, oh yeah, until the lightning struck it, it was doing fine. He goes, well, I don't know how in the world it was working because that thing's full of holes. He said, you're going to have to have not only an outside unit, you're going to have to have an egg hole. Well, guess what? God had blessed us with some extra. Now, let me tell you something. When you get extra money, you need to ask God what it's for. Yes. Yes. That's right. Because He might know of a need that's coming, and you're thinking, man, this is now, it's time for me to go out and buy that whatever, uh, you know, that I want. And God said, no, you got a need coming, and I'm giving you money to take care of it if you'll just be a good steward. Well, it belongs to Him. What right is it for you to spend it without His permission and knowledge? Y'all ain't going to come back tomorrow, are you? (laughs) But you see, that's the truth. That's how we got to live. That's wisdom. Everybody say, that's wisdom. That's wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so when I get to the place where I say, okay, God, uh, I got this extra $3,000 that I didn't know I was going to have. What do I do with it? You know, I've had people that have come up with extra money, come and told me about their blessing, went and spent it on something, and a few months later had a need for that amount of money. And when they come to me, they say, oh, God, I don't know what we're going to do. I said, well, you spent the money. That's the problem. God gave you the money a few months ago, but you didn't ask him what you were supposed to do with it. And now you find yourself in need. Don't blame God. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And he knows what we need. So if you come up with something extra, you need to say, okay, God, you know something I don't know. So we're going to hang on to this unless you tell me that that's what this is for. Mm -hmm. And if you pray and God says, it's okay, you can have this. Because you know what? The Lord doesn't mind you having things that you want. He doesn't mind that. But what he wants you to do, he's testing you to see if he truly is Lord of your finances. That whenever he does these things, that you're willing to say, okay, God, you're the Lord of my finances. What do I do with this money? Well, glory, hallelujah. (laughs) The fear... Not just reverencing God, but referencing God. Going to him and saying, what do you think about this? What do you want me to do about this? What what car do you want me to buy? Well, I want this one. Yeah, but you don't know what's wrong with that one. 
But I, I can tell you that if you choose one that God said, you're going to have no problems. And if you have problems, there's a purpose in it. Can you say amen? amen. And I'm not saying that's going to make life completely flawless. But it sure will take out a lot of mistakes that we've made. Can somebody say amen? amen. And you know what's awesome? Teach your children the same principle and they won't make the mistakes you've made. And they'll end up with more money than you ever had. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Come on somebody. Amen. It's the beginning of wisdom. Yes. Now here's the reason why it's the beginning of wisdom. Okay. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Here's why. Because if you can ever get into that mode, I mean, you love Jesus, you're worshiping God, you're praising God, you're teaching Bible studies, you're studying the Word of God, you're, you're, you're reaching out to people, but the problem is that you're distracted sometimes because of bad decisions you make and things you buy you don't need and, and you're doing stuff you shouldn't do, uh, not, not sinful things, but just making bad decisions because here's the thing, we don't know what tomorrow holds. How in the world can you make a wise decision based on what you know? Because you don't know. You don't even know if you're going to be here tomorrow. Amen. So if we pray, the one that sees all things can see what we need. And if we do it according to his will, it will take everything else you're doing to another level. Yes. Are you hearing me? Yes. The beginning of wisdom is surrendering to the lordship of God and allowing him to be lord over every decision that you make. Yes. Amen. 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 All right. So that is why it's the beginning of wisdom. And then it says, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Because the word holy uh, it means to be set apart in the Hebrew Kodesh, in the Greek Hagios. It means to be set apart for sacred service. Guess what? When you start walking in the wisdom of the Holy Ghost, there is no secular and spiritual sides of your life. Well, you know, that's my secular life. <laughs> okay. All right. I, you know, thank God apostolics don't have that. Jews don't have that either. And so there is no secular side and a spiritual side. All right? Everything is spiritual. Everything is God's. Every decision I make is based on what God wants. And so the beginning of the fear of God also will reveal to you the knowledge of the holy that brings understanding. You become set apart for his service. You know what's going to happen? When you are completely surrendered to the wisdom of the Holy Ghost, when you are completely surrendered to the, to the power of God and to his decision, and you truly are a son of God, surrendered to the Father, people are going to begin to sense that there is something holy about you. That's right. Amen. They're going to sense there's something different about you. Yes. And when you open your mouth, your conversation will be anointed. And even sinners will recognize what you're saying is not a human. Mm -hmm. right. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. Amen. Amen. Am I helping somebody? Amen. It's so practical. I know it is. It's practical. But it's where God wants us to walk. And so wisdom built a house and invited those to come that know they need it. And then said, and what will happen is, you, you, that's the beginning of wisdom. And then the knowledge of the holy is understanding. So what is the understanding? It was talking about in verse 6, go in the way of understanding. Understanding is the pursuit of wisdom in your life so that you can have something to stand on and something will be under you. Understanding is the foundation. Okay? Now let's talk about in the, in the PowerPoint here. If you'll go to it, uh, I think we're going to look at slide number five. And uh, I'm not going to be much longer because I'm just laying a foundation tonight. <laughs> the foundation of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Of course, now this is just a foundation. And of course, we have our anchor boat, bolts and you have your footings and you have the, the concrete. Now, y'all might not do it this way down here. I mean, up here, I don't know. You probably have to do it differently. But, but this is kind of the way that we do it. And I'll never forget when we were pouring the slab for our church. Uh, and we were, it's, it's 17,500 square feet. And it looked like I was paving a football field. And I'm down in this, you know, and I'm the tallest one out there. And I'm down in this footing. And somebody's shouting for Brother Dobbs. And I said, over here. 
And then they shouted for me again. I said, over here. Then it dawned on me. I am deeper in the ground than my head is. They can't even see me where I'm standing. And I'm shouting. And they said, where are you? And I had to stick my shovel up in the air so they know where I was. I mean, that footing was so deep. And, and I promise you, we, we started digging that footing because we had to dig it with the excavator and then had to come back with a shovel. And I'll tell you, when we got down there with a the shovel, I'm beginning to wonder if all this is necessary. <laughs> I'm throwing dirt six foot above my head. And I'm down in this thing and I'm like, you know, is this really necessary? But it is. We have something called Yazoo clay. And literally, it moves. <laughs> That's why our roads are so bumpy if you ever come to Mississippi because the clay under the road is literally moving all the time. And so we have to build our footings deep in the ground because if we don't, our, our, our slab will actually move and crack and all of that because of the, the ground under it is not so strong that it can support the weight. And so we literally have to dig deep footings to establish. And you know what? We put $60,000 in the foundation. And I'm like, you know, we raised 60000 I thought, oh, this ought to go a long way. And then I got the estimates. And I'm like, okay, well, this is just do the foundation. I mean, you know, that, that's all it's going to do. 175 yards of concrete and, and the footings and, and filling up those footings with concrete and rebar and all of that. But you know what? That is necessary. There's some things that are not seen that are necessary. And the things that I'm talking about tonight are the foundation of an apostolic life. The foundation of a powerful ministry. The foundation of Christianity that is not common to today's Christianity, which they say, you know, just as long as it feels good and we believe a little bit, uh, you know, when we go to church every once in a while, we're saved. No, God has an intention for you and he cannot build the structure he desires to build on you until we get the foundation right. Yes. Yes. There have been men and, and even women that have become very powerful in ministry. But the problem was they did not have character and integrity. And because of that, things happened that caused them to fall. And when they fell, they influenced others. I, I'm going to tell you what the Holy Ghost spoke to me. The Holy Ghost wants to do a great work in this church and in this community. I'm going to prophesy what I feel in the Holy Ghost, what the Lord already spoke to me. So I'm not hearing it now. I've already heard it. That God is going to affect the entire Kenai Peninsula with this church. You do not see what God is doing. But what the Lord has said that for me to do is to come here and to help you get this foundation right. Because God said, I cannot build what I want to build on the leadership and on the structure of this church until the foundation is secure. And I know that everything I put on it, it's going to hold it. So that's what the ingrowing has been that you've been going through. That's what you've been experiencing in your heart. That's what. That's why there's some of you, I feel in the Holy Ghost to say this, there's some of you that have literally restructured your life. You, you, even, you don't even look at things the way you looked at them anymore. You don't see things the way you used to see them. You don't even think the way you used to think. Why? Because the Word of God was imparted into you, and the Word of God is seed. And when seed finds fertile ground, it begins to bring forth its nature. Nature. Yes, yes. When God begins to impart understanding into you, understanding is the deposit of God genetics that he begins a download and begins to download his nature into your nature. And so as you begin to diminish your nature, he begins to increase his until you grow to the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ walking in the power and the authority of his spirit. And it is, let me tell you, Jesus in his humanness was just the prototype. In his humanness, he was just the prototype of the Son of God. The reason he came, you know, he didn't just come to die on the cross for our sin and shed blood. 
The reason that God manifested himself in flesh and walked with 12 men for three years was to impart into them the nature and understanding of God because he did not intend to be the last son of God. The only difference between you and me is he's the only begotten. We are begotten of the Spirit. And if we will start walking, and I'm not a Christian, I am the Christ. Hallelujah. Okay, some of y'all don't know how to buckle your seatbelt. Why would I want to be a Christian? That's what they called me at Antioch, and it wasn't a compliment. They first started calling us Christians at Antioch, which meant imitators of Christ. I do not want to be an imitator of Christ when I can be like Christ. The Christ lives in you. So if you start manifesting Christ, they'll start seeing Christ more than they see you. But we have to crucify the flesh. We have to admit that we do not have wisdom. We have to admit that the stuff we know, uh, even things that people have imparted to us, is just physical understanding, and it does not apply to spiritual things. If you try to live for God in your logic, you will miss it every time. If you do only what's logical, you will miss God every time. You don't even have a chance. You're not even going to accidentally please him. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. And it cannot comprehend the way God thinks. Whenever God said, you know, Moses came. And and I'm, I'm almost done tonight because I've just been laying a foundation. Moses came and said, God, we're trapped between two high cliffs here in the, in the Wadi Wattal, in the, in the wilderness, and, and there's an army of Egypt behind us, and there's a very deep Red Sea in front of us. What do we do? I've crossed the Red Sea before, and there are places where the Red Sea is almost 2,000 feet deep, or maybe even a little more than that. And most places in the Red Sea are probably 1,500 feet deep. Just so happens... That where the children of Israel crossed into uh, Saudi Arabia was only 75 feet deep. It was like an underwater bridge. And that's where God led them. So were they there by accident? No, he took them right where they wanted. But he had to put them in a position where their wisdom failed them. <laughs> he brought Moses to the end of himself. Yes. Yes. Oh God, the Egyptians are behind us and they're going to destroy us. No, they're not going to destroy you. I let them come after you for two reasons. Number one, to make you realize how much you need me. Yes. Number two, because I'm going to destroy them. Yes. You see, you see the enemy and you say, oh God, what am I going to do? You see that need and you start running, uh, throwing your hands up in the air and fretting over uh, because you don't know how it's going to be fixed. What you don't know is God allowed it to show you how much you need his wisdom. Yes. When you start walking in his wisdom, you're not going to have near the problems. I tell God all the time, Lord, you don't have to get my attention. You got it. You don't have to. You don't have to give me a blowout. You don't have to uh, dry up the well. You, you don't. Uh, you don't have to do. You don't have to do. I, you already got my attention. You don't have to allow anything to happen uh, that will cause me to to be gr- at grief. Because when I get up in the morning, the first thing I'm going to do is put my feet on the floor, my hands in the air, and I'm going to acknowledge you as my God, and I'm going to surrender to your body, soul, and spirit. I'm going to love what you love and hate what you hate. I'm going to praise you with all of my heart. You got my attention. God won't have to get your attention if you just give him your attention. God won't have to prove to you that you need him if you get up acknowledging it every day. The Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Why in the world is that in the Bible? The Lord doesn't, isn't supposed to lead us into evil. Lead us not into tempta- He's not supposed to lead us into temptation. That's the devil's job. But you know what the, the, what that is saying and what David understood? He understood that if I don't get up every morning and say, God, if you don't protect me from temptation, if you don't protect me from failure, if you don't protect me from falling, I'm going to fall flat on my face. Yes. Yes. So I'm acknowledging right now, this very moment, first thing in the morning, I need you. Yes. I need your strength. I need your conviction. I need your power. I need your love. I need you to surround me with angels. I need you to distract me when I start getting tempted. 
Come on, somebody. Amen. You know, they say you never can get over a problem till you acknowledge that you've got one. Well, I'm just going to acknowledge, you know what? I am a sinner saved by grace. Yes. I will be a sinner until, uh, because this flesh cannot be redeemed. Uh -huh. That's right. So you know what? I'm just going to admit right now, I still have sinful tendencies and I need God to keep me through this day. And at the end of the day, when I've walked without sin, when I've walked in his freedom, when I've walked in his power, when I have emanated and, and I have experienced Christ and I have shown Christ to those that are around me, I can lift up my hand to say for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory that I was able to live without sin that I was able to live without temptation that I was able to live victorious in Christ Amen. it was by his power and his authority yes. we've, got to, we've got to change our way of thinking from the traditional religious thing yes. and, and, and I'm going to say this in close but you see, many of us, maybe some of us, maybe not many of us, it's getting to where it's, it's some of us and not many of us anymore. But, you know, in the previous generation, most everybody you found in a Pentecostal church came from some other church. They were converted, that they saw the fullness of truth, and they came out of this church into this church. And in previous generations, well-meaning godly men and women came from other churches uh, from the nominal world into the truth. But they brought some of their thinking with them that is not apostolic. Yes. Does everybody yes. understand what I'm saying? Yes. So we bring, you know, what mama taught us, what daddy taught us, and they meant well, and they, maybe they were Christians, and, and they taught us things that we, we think that are Bible-based. But the problem is this, is that that is religion. Yes. Relationship is organic. Relationship is alive. Relationship grows. Relationship changes. My relationship with my wife is completely different than it was the day we got married. You know, and when we first got married, you know, we, we, we had our little domestic disturbances. And, and uh, they were pretty, pretty bad, you know, because we were total opposites. But when we made up our mind that we weren't going anywhere, you know, now we can say something to each other and neither one of us are scared because neither one of us is going to leave. <laughs> We're committed to each other. Our relationship is completely different. I've accepted her and her differences. She's accepted mine. And what's funny is but we've become a lot alike after all the years that we've lived together. She's rubbed off on me and... Heaven help her. I've rubbed off on her. <laughs> Relationship is the final blending of two different entities. She'll never cease to be her, but with me, she's different. I'll never cease to be me, but when I'm with her, it's different. Because we've learned to compensate for each other. Everybody understand? Relationship grows. And what, God, what God's intent for marriage, which is nothing more than a physical form of salvation, you call it salvation, he calls it marriage. He's got blood in it. Amen? He gave you his name. It's marriage. Okay? And you call it salvation. And, and of course, you know, we say, well, salvation is a free gift. Yeah, uh, just like the wedding ring is. I mean, if you gave your bride or your, your groom a wedding ring, they put that on their hand saying, okay, I will love no one but you. I will serve no one but you. I will take care of you. I will, I will do what I need to do with you. And there will be no one else in my life. You know what? That ring costs you a whole lot. It costs you social freedom. Yes. Yes. Amen. And you became property. Well, you didn't know that when you put that ring on, did you? <laughs> oh, yeah, but you found out. <laughs> Come on, somebody. So why am I doing all this for them? Well, because you married them. Amen. They're yours, good or bad. And we said for good or bad, right? We just didn't know what we were saying when we said that. <laughs> but it's till death do us part. Amen? Amen? Okay, I told you I was going to quit, and I probably should have already because I'm meddling now. But... But you see, we call it marriage, or salvation, he calls it marriage. You are the bride of Christ. We've got to learn how to blend. We've got to learn how to find ourselves in him and let him find himself in us. 
Amen? Amen. And that is the beginning of wisdom. And wisdom has seven pillars. And we're going to let that wait till tomorrow night. Okay? I hope that I've helped you. I've, I've, you know, I, feel, I felt very different about this meeting. I felt like it was just going to be teaching and impartation. And maybe it won't, be, it won't seem to be as spiritual, but I'm just telling you this. It's going to build up to something, and God is going to do something in these meetings that's going to be completely amazing. Not because I'm here, but because He's here. And because of what His Word does. Am I believing His Word works? So seed has been sowed in your heart. Okay? This was not man's words. This was God's words. Okay? Now, the birds of the air will try to eat the seed. And the difference between seed and feed is how deep it's in the soil. If you throw seed on the ground, it's feed. And the birds are going to find it. But if you dig it way deep in the ground, it's seed. And it's going to bring forth more than it is. Amen? Amen. Every one of you have a blueprint of powerful revival and powerful victory and powerful ministry. But the difference is, are you just going to cast the seed topically on the ground and let the birds of the air and the cares of life and the, the things come and eat it? Or are you going to press it deep within your soul? Yes. I want you to stand with me right now. And I want to teach you a principle if your pastor hadn't already taught it. And he may have. But I want you, when you have received a word from God, I want you to ask the Lord to press it deep within your soul. Yes. I want you to say, God, that was seed. And I want it deep within me. I want it where the, where the fowls of the earth, the cares of life, the, the, the frustrations of life, where they can't touch it. So that I know it will be safe to bring forth. And then the second part of that prayer is, I want this word to dominate my soul. I want it to bring forth a field. A field many times its kind. So that I can be all that God desires me to be. Would you lift your heart and your hands right now? And would you ask the Lord to press it deep? Lord Jesus.